Um, I'm happy to be here talking a little bit about command line cartography. I'm perhaps a little less happy to talk about it after those really cool presentations about doing modern things in the web. So now I'm gonna take you back to 1974 and talk about some <laughs> command line tools. But this is actually a lot of fun when I was putting this together. I realized there's a little blast from the past. About five years ago, I was here at PCD talking about GIS tools. And in that presentation, I made the case that I was only talking about GUI tools and I wasn't gonna talk about code or anything like that at all. So I'm sort of flipping the script now. And I guess if I keep up this trend, I'll come back in another five years and talk about how to make maps in Fortran. <laughs> Actually, I promise I won't do that. So a brief over overview of where we're going to go in this talk. I'm gonna make a, a small case for uh, command line cartography. I'm gonna give you some examples of how I use that at NASA's Earth Observatory. And then share some uh, quick demos with three tools that I think you should know and that will really help your workflow no matter what kind of mapping that you're doing. And in each of these cases, I'm only gonna be able to scratch the surface but if I have any success today, it will be that you may have be introduced to a new tool, try something that you've heard about before, or just make your life just 1% easier when you go home and start making maps. And I know what you're thinking already, especially after those previous talks, that command line mapping is bonkers. That, you know, with all these GUI tools that we have today, we like to see the thing that we're actually working on so we can iteratively design things. But I'm here to tell you it's actually really cool. It's a really fast way to make maps, and there's a lot of elegance to doing that because you can automate things to get consistent output time in and time out. That said, there are some caveats. Obviously, the command line is not the best for every task. It's not the best for every map. And it might not you know, replace your entire workflow, but I'm willing to bet there are steps or a couple steps in there that you can automate or use the command line for to really streamline things in a, in a very concise and elegant way. So I can show you a little bit how I do that at the Earth Observatory, but before I do a quick background on what the Earth Observatory actually is, so we publish a daily article called the image of the day every single day, so 360, 365 days a year, and what that means is we have to make a lot of maps because we're only working five days out of the week. We have to plan for the weekends, holidays, and things like that. So we're making at least you know, one to five maps every single day. That gives us a situation where we have this need to take really complex data and rapidly turn it around into graphics that are easy to understand, attractive, and uh, works for our purpose of communicating all the science and discoveries that are happening at NASA. Since 1999, the EO has put out almost 15,000 images, which was quite a bit, and much of that happened before my time there. But in just, uh, just last year, we put out over 450 individual articles, and each one of those articles has at least one, possibly up to a dozen images that go along with it. So if you can imagine, there's a lot of maps that we're putting out every day, and a big part of that is because of the command line tools I'll be showing you. Our typical article might look like this, where we have some sort of image and then there's some text describing what it is that you're actually seeing, the sensors that went into acquiring the data, what it means, and things like that. Um, this is one of my favorite examples from a couple years ago when Hurricane Matthew came by Florida and the Swami Veers, Veers satellite was able to pick up the night lights that went out as the hurricane passed over Florida. And then we scraped some of the data from the power companies to, to map out the percentage of customers that were actually without power. So basically showing something that we can see from space and how that's actually affecting people on the ground. We also track all these metrics over time. So our reporting has become increasingly visual over the years. And since I joined in 2015, that has been even more the case as now we put out um, articles that have two or more images regularly and the visuals that we are putting out are becoming increasingly map driven. So it used to be a lot of natural color satellite images, Landsat, MODIS, and things like that. And now we're sort of shifting towards a more data driven cartographic approach. And this would not have been possible without command line tools that help us do this in a really fast and speedy way. So I'm, I've talked a little bit about how it actually helped us, 
Now I want to show you some examples that actually used command line tools so you can see um, some real world maps that actually resulted from this. This is the uh, 2016 NASA Black Marble Project. Um, this was a, an annual composite from the VIRS uh, sensor on the SWAMI satellite. These are global data at 500 meters per pixel and they needed to be processed in a consistent way translating the uh, radiance values that the satellite was picking up into something that was actually visible. And then it had to be applied with a color scale, layered with multiple layers, including uh, land cover, water, the night lights, and occasionally we animate this with clouds and things that go over, go over top of it. And all of that was processed with GDAL. There was no conventional GIS tools, no desktop GUI, and it was all done from the command line. Another recent example used that same map as the base map, but this time we overlaid atmosphere, uh, atmospheric particles on top of that. And these include things like black carbon from wildfires, shown in red, um, dust blown in the wind, shown in purple, and sea salt stirred up by winds over the ocean in blue. And the data for this comes in every three hours, so there's a lot of data coming in very fast. It's in a complex format, NetCDF, that doesn't work so well in so many GIS tools. And there are multiple variables within each file. And again, this was all done in GDAL, no desktop GUIs at all. We can also animate things like this. So this map shows Hurricane Florence forming off the coast of Africa and then making its way over the Atlantic over a two week period before it hit landfall in North Carolina. This was two weeks of hourly data, again from the NetCDF format, and also processed in GDAL. No command, or uh, no GUI tools whatsoever. Another animation, and this happens to be one of my favorite visualizations that I've ever made, and this one shows El Nino heating things up on the surface of the Pacific, but we also wanted to show things beneath the surface so we, we can show how the, the cooler water is below the warmer water and those sort of switch places. And then as La Nina kicks in, you can sort of see the Kelvin waves moving across the surface. And this is from a very high dimensional data that included typical geographic things like latitude and longitude, as well as the temperature data that we're looking at, uh, depth, so we could look at it within various layers of the ocean and time. Um, as you saw, there was a map component as well as a, a two-dimensional uh, visualization at depth. And this was um, processed over a two-year period of data. And you guessed it, actually it wasn't made with GDAL. This one was made with Python Matplotlib and ImageMagick. So again, this was something that was done entirely without any GUI tools whatsoever. And in fact, I'm not even sure how you can make something like that in a, in a GUI tool. Um, I'm sure there's probably someone who's ready to do that and to prove me wrong, which, which would be great to see. I'd like to see uh, some tools that actually do that. But this example also highlights something that's really easy to do with command line tools once you get out of the GUI box, and that's faking 3D. So one of the, the best pieces of advice I got from a video producer friend of mine is that when you make 3D visualizations, they don't actually have to be 3D, they just need to look like they are. So to make that thing, it was really simple with a command line tool just to take a basic map, crop it to the area of interest where you're actually gonna have that split at depth, skew the top part so it sort of gives the presence of receding at depth, and then plop on the uh, little visualization at the bottom. So for this particular animation, we did that 730 times, and that might sound like you know, some kind of ordeal, but it was actually very trivial once you, know, you just had a few lines of code and off it goes. So in order to do this kind of thing, there are a few tools that I think you would need to know, and these are the top three uh, that I use pretty much every day in my job. And, and the first one of these is GDAL Translate. And this is kind of the workhorse of the GDAL suite. It does things like convert formats, so you can go from the, uh, the complicated and complex uh, NetCDF, HDF sort of data formats and get GeoTIFFs or JPEGs 
out of it. You can scale data from 32-bit floating point to something like an 8-bit uh, JPEG. And of course, you can geo-reference data really easily, um, resize, resample, and crop data, all from that tool. The other is GDAL warp, and that does things like reprojecting and resampling. So you can go from a regular latitude longitude grid to something like an Alvers projection at a specific uh, pixel resolution that you like. And the last one is GDAL dim. And this does things with digital elevation model as its name suggests. So it can do hill shades, slopes, aspect, and it can apply color palettes, which its name does not suggest. And I think this is one of the most hidden and buried tools in all of geospatial because if you're wanting to apply color palettes, there is no reason that you'd go look for something under a digital elevation tool. Nonetheless, this is like the real MVP of all the tools that I work with because applying color to data is pretty much one of the things that we do so often. So to walk you through how these things work, I'm just gonna step you through some, some commands that I've run on actual data that I've downloaded from NOAA rep representing sea surface temperatures. So these data come as a NetCDF file. And the first thing I'm gonna do is run GDAL translate to convert that to GeoTIFF. So I basically have GDAL translate. I tell it that I'm working with a NetCDF file. I give it the name of that file. And then after that, I tell it which variable within that file that I'll be working with. And then I give it an output file and I get a basic map. At this point, it's just raw data value, so there's not a whole lot of pretty things to look at, but we have a map. Now what I would like to do is crop that data. So in this case, I'm just interested in a portion of the North Atlantic. So again, I'm gonna use GDAL Translate. I'm gonna give it a projection window, defining the upper left and lower right coordinates that I wanna crop. And this time, I'm gonna feed it the GeoTIFF that we made in the last step and then give it an output file name, and now I have a cropped version of that. So it's very similar to what we had before, but now it's cropped to a, a more manageable area that we're interested in. Now to reproject that, I'm gonna use GDAL warp and trans translate that from an equivectorial uh, projection to Albers equal area, and that happens with GDAL warp. And again, I give it an option, in this case, a spatial reference system, um, so this, this is using a Proj4 string, but the SRS option can also use an EPSG value, and I give it the cropped uh, image that we made last time as the input, define an output name, and now I have a projected version of that crop. <laughs> now the fun part that we wouldn't know about unless we did some digging was GDAL dim. Of course, this, in, this is not elevation data, but I would like to give it a palette. So I'm gonna use GDAL dim, and it has the option of color relief. So this is where all the, the color paletting happens with the raw data. So I tell GDAL dim to use the color relief option. I feed it the projected map that we made in the last step. And I give it the special text file, which actually defines the data values and the color breaks that are gonna be used by GDAL dim. Give it an output name. And now I have a projected colored map from that CDF data and just four steps. Now this uh, text file that I fed it is a special file that it's basically a, a space separated file that contains the data values and then the RGB code for the colors that you wanna give each data value. And in this case, I've just grabbed the uh, red blue color scheme from Color Brewer, put in the data values that I wanted to use. And then at the end there, there's an NV for no data value and I've made that black and that resulted in that image there. Now this was just, you know, just a few lines of code to get this final map. Animating that is really easy. If you have a, a directory of files, you just run a simple loop and bash over those files. In this case, it's showing the GDAL dim command running on some um, input there, the F variable, running a, the command with the colors text file, and it's just appending RGB to the output file. So it's just running through that really fast, it only takes a matter of seconds. Converting those outputs into a GIF is just a one-liner with image magic. And now you have a GIF ready to go viral on Twitter. 
but these steps are important for a wider workflow. You might not just you know, be making this one uh, data layer. You might have a more complex map that you're working on, something that's a little more artistic, something that is a little more purposeful. And that's where we come to make a maps sandwich. And basically, this is the bread and butter that all, all of us cartographers do, where you have a base map, and then you have something on top. That something on top can be driven by these command line tools really easily. So by using uh, the command line tools to generate a bunch of thematic layers, you can either stack them if you have a bunch of inputs to add on top of your base map, or these could be individual frames if you're making an animation where the base map is gonna stay consistent, but your thematic layers are gonna animate over time. And then on top of that, you could have you know, country borders, annotations, and other things of that nature. Once you make such a sandwich, you can eat it, share it, or be productive with the newfound time that you had. This has helped the Earth Observatory make better maps faster, but the time that it could save you is yours, so you could do with that whatever you choose to do. And that's, that's all I have, so questions are welcome. All right, we have time for one question. We do. Hi, thanks for that, really enjoyed it. Um, I had a quick question about the kind of back end to all this and the systems administration side of getting GDAO to work, because our experience is it can be really, our systems admin guy really hates it basically, because it <laughs> is so fiddly and getting the latest version of GDAO. You probably have the same IT guy. Yeah, so um, any, any sense of, you know, any kind of tips on the setup you've got for that to make it run so smoothly? It really depends on the software environment you're using. If you're using something like QGIS, it's probably already installed by default along with that process. Um, on Windows, it can be a bit of a bear, but I've found a lot of success using the, the Linux subsystem for Windows, and just basically you end up with a bash environment. Um, that might not make your IT guy any happier, but it gets you to GDAL a lot faster. Last round of applause for Josh Stevens, everyone. Thank you.